last like five to 10 years, we've seen a huge influx of female created content and like messy, flawed female characters. But that was so groundbreaking even recently. You know, I mean, 10 years ago, we didn't have that. So I really wanted to play roles that were dynamic and interesting. You know, I'm doing reading pilot scripts all the time and I'm the character that's interesting is the guy and the woman just exists in his orbit floating around him, you know, ancillary to him with no goals of her own, with no path of her own. It's all about the dude. And it's like, I want to play that character. You know, that's way more interesting. So I really wanted to play characters that were dynamic and flawed and complicated and human in a way that I didn't see reflected in the scripts I was getting in the auditions I was having. So I was like, okay, well, if no one's going to give me these roles or write these roles, I'm going to write them myself. Right. So that's kind of why I got into writing, just to be able to take that power back and claim ownership and be able to do the roles I wanted to do and play the characters I wanted to play because I wasn't getting those opportunities in the other things. Parallax. You are now tuned into the Parallax Effect. It's not the message, it's the messenger. What up, Ryan? It's time. Parallax. Old mill's better than no mill. Guess who's back to make mountains out of molehills? If this don't move you, I bet my folks will. This beat's smooth, but trust me, there ain't no chill. Ask Ryan, if I'm lying, I'm flying. It's the sculpture of all aspects of the culture. Parallax. The people's podcast is back. Laying it down flat for you wherever you at. Your job and your car and your jog and your flight. Loads of archives with no ending in sight. Hitting on any topic, long as it ain't no nonsense. You can see the others for the drama and the gossip. Word the brat, best there ever was. Recognize it. Never secondary, my eyes stay on the pocket Parallax And if you feeling the vibes, give us five stars Oh, and follow and subscribe Parallax Sit back and recline, relax and enjoy the ride Cause it's that Parallax And you just passed the test This is the Parallax Effect Come on Parallax Sit back and recline, relax and enjoy the ride Cause it's that Parallax And you're here, that's mad respect Welcome to the Parallax Effect Yeah podcast where we continue to navigate through the shifting tides of perspectives. I am your host, Ryan Lavelle. Thank you so much again for taking the time to spend with us in your car, on your jog, or your flight, wherever. I hope you have some leg room if you're on your flight. Uh, Let me start, though, as I always do, by letting you know that you can follow us on Instagram at Parallax Effect Media. Once again, that's Parallax Effect Media. Also on Facebook at the Parallax Effect Podcast. Also on Twitter at Parallax Effects. Once again, that's Parallax Effects with an S. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel. The link will be in the show description as well as on the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Um, Before we get started, I just wanted we have more great news to share as we have obtained our second sponsor for the second week in a row. We are on a roll. Um, Today's show is brought to you by Woodworks Custom Cabinetry. That's Woodworks, W-U-D-W-U-R-X. Um, and Woodworks is your trusted professional for all of your millwork, carpentry, and cabinetry needs. From custom kitchens, bathrooms, cabinets, to home bars and trim, they are committed to providing you with satisfaction completing your home project. Find them on Instagram and on LinkedIn at Woodworks. Okay, business has been taken care of. Let's now move forward. I am going to introduce our guest for the day. I am very excited. I've known her for several, several, several years. Always been a very exciting, effervescent person. Brings light to the party everywhere that she goes. Uh, She is a California native who now splits her time between Los Angeles and the ATL. That's Atlanta for all my folks not as cultured. That's okay. Um, She graduated magna cum laude, that's the top of the top, from the University of Southern California, quite a feat. Not too many people have done that. Uh, She has been featured in national commercials for many major brands, including things that you wear, things that you've heard of, things that you use, such as Gap, Budweiser, and Geico. Um, Her first major television appearance came 
on the long running soap opera days of our lives. Everybody has seen that for sure. And this was quickly followed by a guest appearance on one of my favorite shows, Dexter. Um, she has then since branched out into writing, directing, and producing the trifecta with her pilot scripts, Ties, and The Other City, have been, which have been semifinalists in multiple screenwriting competitions, including the highly competitive Austin Film Festival. We will get into that. Um, her dark, darkly comedic web series, Disgraced, uh, made its premiere in the spring of 2021 at the Women's Co uh, Comedy Film Festival. It has since played at over 45 film festivals, garnering over 20 award nominations and 10 wins, including uh, multiple Best Comedy and Best Actress actress wins, for sure. That is, that is a big deal. Um, her, her directorial debut, Lexi, which she also wrote and stars in, so she's doing a lot here, was released in fall 2022. Her latest project, Cold Blows the Wind, premiered at the Horror Hound Film Festival in March of 2023 where it won Best Feature Judge's Choice, and she was nominated for Best Actress. So you know where I'm going with this. She also is a huge animal lover, um, an avid volunteer with multiple uh, organizations that help out, um, including the Angel City Pit Bulls, and she is the proud dog mom of three rescue pit bulls. So without further ado, I would like to introduce my friend and award-winning actress, Victoria Vertuga is in the Parallax Effect. Welcome so much, and how are you? Thank you so much for having me. So excited to be here. It's also a very weird experience to have someone like read your bio out loud. You're like, oh no. Yes, uh, I did kind of take. I did kind of take that off your it. IMDb. I was like, yeah. Damn. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. It's it's a unique experience. For sure, it was a lot to cover, and I hope I got through it. I hope I did it. Uh, I hope I did it right. Did it just. Yeah, um, just for yeah, you for sure um so usually um we uh, you know I, I like to kind of start with um your upbringing like who you were especially yeah. before I met you because that's around the USC time so growing up where did you grow up what were your influences give us give us some uh some of the youth of Victoria Vertuga yeah so I was actually born in the Bay Area uh, my family was in the process of or about to move to the UK. So I lived in uh, when I was two weeks old, we moved from the Bay to stay with my grandparents in the Midwest until I was old enough to fly internationally, which is like a six week minimum requirement. So when I was six weeks old, we moved to the UK just outside of London. And we lived there until I was about five. And then my family moved back to the States and we moved to San Diego. And then I stayed in San Diego until it was time for college. I moved up to, to LA to go to USC. So yeah, they, most of my childhood was in San Diego. Most that most that I remember was in San Diego. <laughs> right. Bay Area yeah. to UK to San Diego. Yes. Um, very yes. beautiful place. If you haven't been there, that is a must yes. destination. Yes. Uh, so what did you grow up on the beach? Were you more inland or what was what was the deal? We were pretty close to the beach. We're like three miles away. I, I grew up in a, in a neighborhood called Solana Beach, um, which is in North County, San Diego. So like uh, if you're heading down from L.A., it's it's like the old past. Like it's Oceanside, Carlsbad, Encinitas, Solana Beach. So it's like on the northern part, closer to L.A. Um, and I went to Torrey Pines High School, which I hated um, very, very much. It was not my vibe. Uh, very lots of very rich out of touch kids um but it was a huge high school we had about a thousand people per class so there, my each graduating class there was like by the time i left my senior year, year we had close to five thousand students there wow. um so it was a huge huge high school but um and i had a lot of good times too but yeah it was it was an interesting experience san diego was funny because i didn't love it growing up in the sense that like i was kind of bored and i thought that like it wasn't that cool and whatever, but as an adult, I appreciate it so much more. Like I go visit my mom all the time down there because it's just like so much more peaceful and quiet and less traffic and people are nicer. And even though I'm in the industry, ironically, I like that it's like just there's no industry stuff down there. It's just like chill. So um, I think I it took a while for me to appreciate that, but but now I do. <laughs> but now you do. Uh, do you ever go Thank back you. now? Do you still have folks down I there? I go all the time. Yeah, I visit my mom like once a month. My sister lived down there too until recently. She's getting um she's getting her side D right now, so she's actually she moved for her for school for the last like year and a half. So um, but she comes down a lot still too. So yeah, I go down about once a month. I also have a huge Italian family on my mom's side. She's one of eight kids, oh, wow. um, the second of eight. And over the years, they grew up in the Midwest. They grew up in Ohio, but um, over the years two of her siblings have moved out to California, kind of when I was in high school. So um, I have like at this point there's 
I don't know, close to 20 of us. Um, Cause it's like my mom's sister and her husband and their two kids. And then my mom's brother and his wife and their two kids. And then my one cousin is now married and has two kids. So when we get together, just like the California contingent of us, it's like close to 20 people, um, which is like, you know, a fifth of half of my family. Um, but yeah, it's great. It's nice to have family there now too. And I, yeah, I love going home. It feels like it feeds my soul. It like gives me little clarity it helps me. I'm actually going down this weekend to see my mom. So yeah, it's nice. It makes me feel like I can breathe. I can think I can, you know, there it's nice. is Get out of the quite about no life. place like home. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, that is a beautiful thing to have access to pretty much weekly if you would like it. So um, excellent. Do you have yes. any memories of being in the UK or is that too early? I do. I have a few. Um, I literally remember that it was always cloudy, which is accurate. Apparently it's always cloudy there. Um, and I used to go, I love animals. As you mentioned in my bio, I used to go with my mom to like this pond and we would feed the ducks and I like loved it. I was obsessed with being the ducks. So I remember that. Um, and I remember some, some snowy times, um, I couldn't walk. I was really little and I get all bundled in my snow gear and I like would fall over a lot because I couldn't walk well in my like bundled up attire. So yeah, that's about it. I remember clouds falling on my butt and uh, feeding ducks. That's not quite like San Diego, apparently, right? A little <laughs> bit more clear skies. Not quite. And all that. Yeah, yes, very good. Exactly. So Tory Pines, Tory Pines was not the business. I think most people know about Tory, Tory Pines because of the golf course down there. Um, yes, exactly. So yeah, I mean, it, it look like the great thing about San Diego is we have excellent public schools. Like I have received an excellent education and it was free. It's not like LA where you guys have to spend like a gajillion million dollars to go to, you know, private school your whole life. Like it's insane. My public, I had a public school education in my entire life, always good schools, very blessed in that way. Um, and I had some great memories and met some lifelong friends there. So I had a good time. It just, in general, the vibe was a little, you know, yeah. not a little pretentious, not, not just a little bit. A little yeah. pretentious, a little yeah. bit, a little bit. So what were the choices yeah. going into college? I mean, obviously, we know USC won out, but was there um, any decisions to be made there? Yeah, there were. There were a ton. So I kind of I kind of picked um, by city. So I was like, what cities would I want to live in? And then I kind of did that. So I picked the best schools like in those cities. So I applied to a bunch of schools in New York, in Philly, in Chicago, in Boston, um, in L.A., uh, my dad is an alum f or from Northwestern, so he really wanted me to go to Northwestern. And I went for and did a weekend like thing there, and I it was not for me at all. So I uh, did not even apply, but I told him I applied and I didn't get in because I didn't want to be <laughs> pressured into going. Um, but I got in most places. Uh, I had a bunch of friends that already went to USC. I, w I had a lot of friends older than me, um, grades ahead. So I had a couple friends, really good friends that were in SC uh, for like the year prior to me graduating. And I loved it. Like I would come up all the time and visit and stay with them. And um, I loved to, I knew I wanted to do something entertainment industry focused and USC has a lot of really unique cutting edge programs in that, in that sphere. So that was great. I also love, this is like a silly college thing, but I love that we had like apartments, like you could like live in an apartment, not a dorm, like with your own bathroom and like, you know, I mean, you had roommates and whatever, but like, you know, not, not the public bathroom for the whole floor and like a kitchen. Cause I love to cook. So I was really excited about an apartment. So yeah. And then I ended up getting um, a partial scholarship to USC as well. So all those things kind of factored in. Right. To my decision. So the partial yeah. scholarship, the location, the apartments, the, uh, yeah. I had a, uh, another guest on actually the first episode, he also went to USC and he coined it as the, the yeah. university of serious connections. I really like that. Um, oh, so I've you, never heard that. Yeah, yeah. That, that was pretty good. That was pretty good. Um, so you got some connections there in the entertainment industry. Um, you're driving up the five all the way up to LA doing your thing. And you were there, I believe when during the more formative years of USC football, right? When USC football yes. was the football ticket in town, uh, there were no Rams yes. and chargers here in LA at that time. So what was that? Did you go to any games? Do you have any memorable experiences oh there? Absolutely. So yeah, so me and like your the friend Ryan that we have a friend, we have a common, uh, we, and we had this crew of people, we would this was before, I think they changed how they do this, but you would basically first come first serve for the student section. So you would buy like an athletic pass that got you access to all of your, all of the home games for all the sports for the year. And it was like really cheap at that time. I think I'm sure that's gone up too, but it was like, I don't know, 45 bucks or maybe a hundred bucks max. And then, yeah, it was just first come first serve to get into the student section. So this was like the era when we were amazing. So you had to get there super early. So we were there like hours before waiting to get in and so we could have like those bomb ass seats at the front. Um, it was just such an, an insane experience. And this was like, so I think my freshman year was Carson Palmer's last year. And then I was there for like, you know, the Matt Leinart, Reggie Bush era and our national championships and all that. So USC was the hot ticket. Like you said, there was no professional football team. So we kind of became LA's, you know, football team by default. And we had Snoop Dogg showing up at games. We had uh, 
it's the Funkadelic showing up at games. We had, I mean, every game was like a star-studded, ridiculous event. You just look around and there's like, you know, Snoop Dogg comes to rap and whatever, just crazy stuff. So it was a really exciting, high energy, like bubbling time. It was really cool to be a part of. There was just kind of like a really nice energy on campus that I think it brought to the school in general. I love that about college and it, it, period, like the, the energy on a campus, it's like all full of possibilities, right? Kids are young and there's like the whole life ahead and all these possibilities. So I love that energy in general. And I think the, the addition of just football being so good and, and like being on the brink of something awesome added to that energy that was really cool to be a part of. So yeah, we had a, we had an absolutely fabulous time at USC. I had, I loved my experience there. It's like such a quintessential college in the sense that it has whatever you're looking for. You know, if you are into Greek life, cool it has that if you're into sports definitely has that it's a beautiful campus has like i said it has a, a lot of these really cool cutting edge programs like for me the entertainment stuff like my husband uh tim he was a video game miner which was kind of really groundbreaking at the time um and they were really good with those things about the companies in those industries looked to hire kids from these programs. So it helped you, you know, when you graduated, it helped you because they were like, oh yeah, we want kids from this, you know, video game minor program. We want kids from the music industry program. So that was definitely an advantage as well. But yeah, I loved my time at USC. I had a blast. That's definitely the way it should have been. Um, I, I was kind of at Arizona at the time, so I didn't really get a lot of time spent with you on campus, but there were some memorable, nice, definite moments um, there as well too. Um so we know, obviously, you know, magna cum laude, so you, we know you studied hard and studied the right way and all that kind of stuff, but were there any kind of like uh, uh, moments of trepidation or any type of, uh, not, not necessarily slip-ups, but hardships over there w during your time at USC? Not so much. I think that life, my life was stacked after that. It was like, you're going to have so many coming up when you graduate. We're going <laughs> to make this real easy for you. So I was also like, I've been a really good student my whole life. I skipped grades. Um, I graduated high school really young and college really young because of that. Um, so it's not that I don't study. I clearly study and I clearly value you know, education and doing a good job, but I have become really efficient. So it, I know exactly the minimum effort I need to put in to get the maximum result. So I wasn't somebody who was like glued to my books constantly. Like I, again, I would study and I would make sure I did what I needed to do, but I never felt like, oh my God, this is so much and so overwhelming. I also had the benefit, you know, I wasn't an engineering student or an architecture student or some of these programs that are much more challenging. I did have a lot of stuff because I had like three minors in my major, but I never really felt super overwhelmed. I felt like I had it you know, I had my, my methods down and my process down for studying and getting things done. And I felt, I felt good about that. So yeah, I did come in undeclared though. And I had to like, I remember they, they, the, the program I ended up doing my music industry program, they put me through like a ringer of a lot of interviews. There was like quite a process to, to get admitted into that program. It was kind of, um, desirable and whatever at the time so yeah that was that i was like there was a moment where i was like oh no am i gonna get into this thing um but i did and it was fine it all worked out and but what, yeah, in was general, that, I didn't what was that yeah. process like what was the competition like i imagine that's a very uh popular like you said um a major to get into what what was that experience like yeah so th there were just a lot of rounds of interviews so music industry was kind of it was basically like the business of music a degree that's the business of music so you had either like a creative focus or a um, like if you played an instrument, you'd have like the musical focus if that's what you wanted to do. If you didn't play an instrument, you were just solely on the business side. And it kind of had almost a business minor built in, which is why it was easy for me to do the business minor because um, we had a lot of like business stuff. But we had music law, like contract law. We had, uh, oh, I don't even remember anymore. So many, so many specific things, which was really cool. It was very relevant information to how the industry focus, uh, you know, runs and is, is it was, it was very like pertinent, relevant information. So yeah, they made me do just a series of like a ton of interviews, you know, just meeting with this faculty, meeting with that faculty and doing all that stuff, making sure your head is on straight and that you seem like somebody that they want representing that program, that you will thrive in it after graduation. So, yeah. So got the major, obviously. Congratulations on that. We all know Thanks. kind of what happens next. But then what about all the minors? How did that all that factor in? What made you decide, all right, I need to make sure that I have all these, you know, minors in. I'm, uh, I'm uh, you know, accelerating and making sure that my whole resume is complete and filled out. Yeah, I, um, I'm very easily bored. I don't sit still well. So I like having lots of things uh, on my plate and lots of things to do. So I, like I said, I had almost a built-in business minor. So I just had to take a few extra classes for that, which was easy. I have always loved um, acting. I've always been a, 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 somebody who loves theater and loves the art of acting. So that was kind of a given that I would do that theater minor. And then communications was a really good program. I was deciding between music industry and communications for my major. 
um, and decided going with the, the path that I did, music industry for the major, comp for the minor. But it was, I loved it. It was all about like analysis, which is my whole jam. Like, and, and the focus was specifically communications and the entertainment industry. So it was, again, entertainment focus, but it was all about kind of how we consume media and the power of media and stories and stereotypes and portrayals and all that kind of stuff, you know? So we would be watching a lot of stuff, reading a lot of stuff, analyzing it, talking about, uh, yeah, biases and all kinds of things that I found super interesting. And I love that. Like, that's my, I love to get into those discussions and I'm always analyzing stuff. So that for me just fed that part of my brain that is much more into the analytical versus the the business side was very much more practical, if that makes sense. So yeah, I kind of enjoyed having the variety of, of things to, to do and talk about. Those calm classes are some of my favorite classes, like amazing speakers coming, just talked about really cool stuff, things I still remember to this day. And I think my professors did a great job of you know, there's a lot of talk in college about like bias one way or the other and not having multiple perspectives given. And, and and that was not the case for us. Like they were very, very good about having anybody from all kinds of opinions and all kinds of stuff speak their minds so that we could actually have discussions, even if we disagreed, even if whatever, which I think is a, a, such an important thing and something that we're desperately missing in our society today. So yeah, I really enjoyed like getting all those perspectives and having all that stuff. Like we had Larry Flint come and talk to us. We had Ariana Huff. We had Huffington. Like, we had... um. Oh my God, so many people, just like really cool people come and talk about all kinds of stuff. So I really, really enjoyed those programs, probably more than anything else I took there. Right. And I, yeah, that is definitely hopefully not a lost art. We hear about a lot of uh, some of the different things going on in some of the more um, popular colleges nowadays across the U.S. And they don't quite have the freedom that we used to back in our day. So I hope that can return for them to gain, you know, multiple perspectives, which is what this show is about, right? Just giving out perspectives to everybody and um, and letting everybody be heard, you know? Absolutely. And there's so much to learn, right? Like, it's okay to disagree. You can still, like, what I think is lost is like, the ability to disagree and still respect somebody, right? You you know, mm. you can still respect someone's right to their opinion. And the fact that they have a different experience and a different take on something, you know, it doesn't have to turn like, this into this super animus thing. So yeah, I think that that was a really, a uh, a very beneficial thing to experience and be a part of. And yeah, I hope that schools will still allow multiple perspectives discussion. Right. Let them in, man. Let them in. Don't censor anybody, yeah. but that's just my point yep. of view. Um, so yes, you definitely took care of everything on the academic side, as we just mentioned. And you also um, basically, not basically, you did meet your soulmate at USC. Uh, we talked about him, the big homie, Tim. Um, so your personal yeah. life, you know, also took off as well, too. So you 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 were hitting the ground running and that's pretty good. <laughs> I can't complain. Things were good. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And Tim is a guy like uh, speaking of you um, talking about having whatever conversations and different things come up. Uh, Tim is a person I haven't told him this, but he is probably I could kind of rattle off the top of my head, like the top five. Um, it, just generally knowledgeable, but also like he's a very good debater, right? Excellent. And I kind of shy away from debates with him because of that. You know, sometimes I'll jump in there and, and I'll get after him. Um, but, you know, sometimes I, you know, kind of bow down a little bit because he's he's he knows what he's talking about. He knows how to how to express himself very, very um, precisely. And he gets to his point. So I've always respected that about him. And I'm wondering, is that something you noticed when you first met him? Or did you find that out later? Or how do you even feel about that? Yeah, I think he's come into that, you know, as he's grown and matured, come into that. But yeah, he's definitely always been someone who, uh, again, talking about respect, who's able to disagree and interested in the discussion and interested in why you feel how you feel, not just trying to prove his point or change your mind. So I think that's great. And for me, I love... I need someone who can stimulate me mentally and I need to be like, we need to be able to have discussions and have debates and like, we need to be able to do that. Like that is so important to just my dynamic and relationships with everybody. So yeah, I think the fact that we are able to do that and same with him, like we don't, we disagree on so many things, but that's fine. Right. Like, mm-hmm. and we'll have, we'll sometimes we'll, one of us will change our mind at the end of something because we'll have learned something we didn't know or see it from a different perspective. But I think it's really important. That's such a good skill to have. And I agree. He's, he's, yeah, he's also very patient, right? Years of dealing with True. me. No, he's very patient. So he like gets his point across in a very calm way. And like, yeah, it's, it's, it's I agree. He's definitely good at debating. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. And, and, in, in the most positive way, that's the most positive compliment that I can give. And I often find myself um, either texting or on the phone with him on voting day, you know, just trying to figure yes. out what all these propositions yes. are saying, what they really mean. Uh, so that's something that's valuable to me. 
Totally. We, yeah, the two, me and him, we like get the ballot and we like look up the stuff and we're trying to do the arguments and figure out what is it really doing, right? Because it's like there's the, the saying, whatever it says it does, it's usually doing the opposite. It's like there's so much truth to that. So yeah, I, definitely. And he's also somebody who I think it's very important for him to be informed on things. And he, right. he makes it a, a point to, to be informed, which is great. Sometimes that. I'm, yeah, he definitely does. There's things for me, I will be honest, where I'm like, I don't even want to think about that right now. Like, mm -hmm. I don't have the mental energy. Like, I don't even can't go there. But he is like, definitely someone who always wants to go there. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's definitely one of his I mean, he has a ton of great qualities, but that's one of his best yeah. ones. So shout out to you, Tim dog. Um, I know I gave you a ton <laughs> of compliments, but I'm still coming after you on the next debate. Don't think I'm not. And it's funny because on the uh, on the thread that him and I and Ryan Boykin, uh, my best friend, have um, Ryan can some, I mean, and it, it's dynamic. Everybody gets their thing in, but Ryan really hears him and I go back and forth and he's like, it's like a tennis match. He's like, yes, ooh, watch ooh, the ooh, yes. ooh. like who's going to yes. say what? Um, so it's, it's real fun having that with, with the, with the two of them. Uh, so thank you for sharing Tim with us in that light for sure, My for pleasure. sure. Um, but yeah, <laughs> we move on from the USC day. So you graduate there, magna cum laude with your 15 majors and minors and all that kind of stuff. And you go out into the world and what is the agenda there? What are you trying to be or what, what was your first job out of college? Yes. So I kind of, my thought was that I would work on the business side of entertainment and that that would kind of, cause I am, I'm very type a and I'm very organized and I like, um, I like stability on some level. So I thought that that would be a more satisfying existence to have like a day job in entertainment where I don't have the, all the ups and downs and the unknowns of like, you know, full-time career as an artist, uh, but I'm still close to it. So my first job out of school was working for Warner Chapel, which is a music publishing company. It's the publishing arm of Warner Music Group. So a publishing company basically is to songwriters, like what a record label would be to the artist. Mm. So they sign and represent songwriters. Um, and I, like I said, I was a songwriter as well. So, um, that was yes so the music industry is a shady shady industry so i learned i saw a lot of that firsthand i i experienced a lot of that uh this was the time because we're old we're aging ourselves when like myspace music was a thing and so when they were like looking for people to sign they would tell them like don't listen to the music no one cares about the music like how many followers they have you know on myspace music and stuff and so it, i kind of got a little jaded and disillusioned with the music business working on on that um, I left Warner Chapel. So Warner Chapel was a nice place. People were perfectly nice. It was fine. It was just kind of not stimulating and challenging to me mentally. It's kind of boring, to be honest. And there were a lot of people there who had worked there their whole lives in the same job, just doing the same thing for like, you know, a lot of the, the older employees in their 50s and 60s and stuff. And that thought just honestly terrified me. Like the mm. thought if, if I do nothing, like if I make no effort and I just coast that this is what I will be doing for the next, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, I was like, oh, no, 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 I don't want that. Um, so at first I tried to just find another job in the music industry that I thought would be more fulfilling. <laughs> and I ended up, um, oh my God, I can't remember, Current TV, that's what it was. I ended up becoming the music licensing person at Current TV, which was Al Gore's company, a uh, uh... very short-lived company. Yeah, and that was the worst job I have ever had in so many ways. And it was the best thing that could happen to me because it really, having that job and having it be so crappy and having myself be so miserable and like hitting that low really just gave me the courage to do what I really wanted to do anyway that I'd kind of been avoiding, right? And I learned an important lesson that I think I'm totally glad that I, I tried to work on the business side and had those day jobs because I thought going into it that stability was going to be more important for me than freedom. And I learned that the opposite is true. I really need that freedom. Like I thrive with that freedom. Like I talked about the reason I have 17 majors and whatever, I get bored so easily mm -hmm. and I need to have multiple things going on to feel, you know, sane basically. So the monotony of a day job, just like the same people, the same things every day, just slowly drove me crazy and wore me down. It was not for me at all. So the fact that that second job was terrible, like we straight up, the art department was in a roll up garage of this janky building in Hollywood. We had no parking and it was in Hollywood and I had to move my car every two hours. My boss was like the rudest chick. Every time I'd go move my car, she's like moving your car again as if it's like my fault. Like, like I don't oh, parking spot. What am I supposed to do? Just, yeah, we didn't have a microwave to heat up food. Like we had no windows because it was, it was, it was like, when I say it was a janky job, it was janky. And it's funny because when I interviewed again, this was like a very, competitive job almost like 
I know at least a dozen people from my program who, who I um, interviewed for the same job. And they're, oh, Vic, you got it. Oh, my God, congratulations. Like, it was this coveted thing. And then it was not. They flew me out. Their headquarters were in San Francisco. So, like, they flew me out to San Francisco for my second interview and, like, put me up at this nice hotel. And the reality of the job was, like, the exact opposite. Um, but also, again, they just, like, there wasn't enough responsibility. You know, I'm somebody who thrives with being challenged and, and responsibility, and no one was utilizing me. And I was just bored out of my mind and so miserable, being treated really poorly. So, yeah, I, I only lasted, like, I don't know, eight months there. And I was like, nah, something's got to give. So I left there and then um, decided to do what I really wanted to do, which was, um, you know, be on the creative side. So uh, I, I got into acting. Um, I had been print modeling a little bit since uh, college. I kind of just fell into it. Um, one of the photographers who took my headshot wanted me to model for this um, pinup project he was doing. And I've always loved that genre. So I just kind of fell into it. So I was doing a lot of print modeling as well, a lot of commercial like ads and stuff like that. So kind of fell into that. Um, and then, yeah, I, I acted and did a lot of commercials, got my first TV breaks. Uh, but like, again, I get bored easily. So I was kind of becoming unsatisfied with just the opportunities presented to me and the quality of the roles I was going out for and stuff and feeling like I didn't really even have control over my own career in so many ways. So uh, I've always been a writer. So I started, you know, writing screenplays and writing and producing and directing. And that has been amazing just in terms of the education it's given me for the industry as a whole, like learning all the different, all the different things, all the different uh, areas and whatever has just made me better at whichever one I'm doing because I have a bigger understanding of the whole process and all the players in the process. So that has been very empowering as well to like take control over it and make it my thing. And yeah, so that's kind of my journey to where I'm at. So, how, whoop, that was a lot. Yeah. How do you, and, and by the way, the, the, the moving the car every two hours thing would have had me ready to walk out too. And amongst all the other Dude. things that you talk about. Um, yeah, that would have, I couldn't I stand hate that. Finding parking yeah. and it's not like it was, a, it was a crowded area you know so you have like drown, drown, drown. oh my god can't right do it. and it's Twice one of those things like day. where you find a good parking spot you feel like you need to call somebody tell them about it or put it in the parking hall of fame or something um yes. so I, I completely you feel you on that i yes. completely feel you on that um but yeah now you you found your way um you had those experiences like you said which ended up being something that kind of helped you accelerate down the pathway to success um, in your own right, for sure. Um, but what were or how long does it take? That was my question. How long does it take or where? how do you think of when you're writing uh, these shows, these scripts? Like, how, what is that process like? What's the creative process like? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's I think it's so different for everybody. And I think the time varies so much depending on the project and the situation and whatever. Um, if I'm doing something independently, you know, I have the benefit of being on my own timeline. I don't have deadlines, you know, set for me by the studio or set for me by the in the writer's room. So I can do kind of what I want when I want, which is amazing. So yeah, it's been it's I think I started with um, I started writing some shorts and I started dabbling in a feature. And then as luck would have it right when I was starting to write, a director that I had worked with years back on like a horror film hit me up and he was like, Hey, I saw that you're starting to write. Like, would you want to work together and do something together? So we started writing together and I loved that. Like, it's so great to have a partner because it's kind of such a lonely thing to be stuck at home writing all day. So it was really nice to just have a partner in the journey and have somebody to bounce those things off of. So uh, the first thing that we worked on was a together was a half an hour um, TV pilot. So pilot is the first episode of, you know, of a series. So mm -hmm. we came up with an idea for the series we wrote the pilot, we kind of would go, would like outline it and then, you know, go back and forth. Like I'd write some pages, send it to him, he'd write some pages, send it back and kind of go back and forth until we were happy with it, did a bunch of rewrites. And we decided to just like map out the first season arc and then go ahead and write the whole first season just as like a writing exercise of nothing else, which was really a fun process. So I think that whole thing took us maybe, I don't know, probably six months, maybe, maybe slightly longer. Um, it was also our first time working together. And then since then we've written multiple other pilots. We did um, my web series, which was like eight episodes of like 10 minute, 10 minute segments. Um, we did uh, feature films. We've done all kinds of stuff. So yeah, it, the timeline really just kind of depends. It also depends on the project. Like sometimes you're feeling it and it just all comes out of you. And sometimes they're clunky and you're like, oh, this is a, eh, eh. it's a lot of stopping and starting, you know? So mm -hmm. it also depends on your discipline and your schedule. Uh, one of the things that's somewhat challenging is I, I, especially at the time when I started writing, I was doing a lot of like modeling gigs still and a lot of acting gigs and whatever. So I didn't necessarily have a set schedule you know, to sit down and write. This is, these are my hours every day that I sit down and write. Every day was different for me. So it's like, okay, today I have two hours in the afternoon. You try to make the most of it. So it can be challenging to work piecemeal that way. Uh, I think when you have a set schedule and a set routine, 
it allows you to be a little bit more disciplined and like get into the flow a little bit better. So uh, I know sometimes when I'm coming off of like a project where I've just been acting or doing other things and getting back into writing, it can be a little like eat, eat, stop and stop and go and got to like find my flow again. So yeah, it's that's like a non-answer to your question, but there really is no answer to your question. It's it's a the process is like different every time and for every person and yeah. <laughs> so can you can you post up on the couch and write at home, or do you need to go down to Starbucks, or do you need to go to the south of France? Like what what? Where do we need yeah, to be at for I, the most creativity to come out? Yeah, I think it, I, I write at home in general, I think out of sheer laziness, uh, more than anything, to be perfectly honest. Um, I'm not really like a Starbucks-y kind of person. I can't just see myself. A lot of people do that just for the, for, to like get rid of the distractions. And I understand that. Like it's distracting, right? Like you, I have my dogs here now. Tim works from home too. So like it, that was definitely an adjustment, having him at home too, because that is like more, it does create more distractions. So I totally get people wanting a place. I think um, if I had more space in my house, I would have a room so I can at least have my own little room where I can go and, and do that. Cause I think it does help you to, to have an area so that you can be free of distractions. Yeah. Um, people say like most of writing is sitting and it really is like, it's like a lot of it is just the discipline to like sit and some days it's coming and some days it ain't. And you've got to just kind of allow yourself the time and the space, you know, for it to, for it to happen. So, right. yeah. I think when I really, really finalized the idea for the show, which still kind of is nebulous at some times we were at a, a hotel in palm springs jasmine and i were there and i did the uh i guess the quintessential like buy a drink and take the napkin and start writing show ideas on it Love and it. i think if i wasn't there or didn't have that getaway I, it was something i could wouldn't have been able to do at home totally i totally get that i know for me um when i'm stuck like when i'm working on a story working out the outline like work, working whatever like getting up and walk, like going on a walk is so helpful for me because they've even done studies on the human brain and how we work and like the classroom, the fact that we like sit, sit stationary all day and try to learn is actually like the least effective way for us to process things. We humans were made to learn while moving. So for me, a lot of times just the act of like going on the walk will loosen things up for me and like ideas come and whatever. So for me, definitely when I'm stuck, I have to like do the opposite, get out of my house and get moving but versus like, you know what I mean? Being, yeah static and stationary that definitely helps for me i totally understand being somewhere else too like we find it, yeah inspiration comes in all different ways and all different kinds of of time i think i think the trick or one of the traps that people get stuck in as a writer is that you're you're relying on the inspiration all the time whereas i said like it's more discipline than it is inspiration because you gotta some days you gotta write when the inspiration isn't coming right so it's like the discipline to like again create that space and allow yourself to sit there and and get going you know right. and some days will be harder than others because yeah if, if we just relied on inspiration you know as much as you wish it would come all the time you know it's fickle yeah completely so but how do you deal with the distractions right so you're in your zone doorbell rings oh i'm a yes. uh, you know i got this whatever whatever promotion going on and you slam the door go back to what how long does it take you to get back in the zone yeah, I think fortunately for me, when I'm in the zone, I I am pretty good. I think I think what I struggle with is I I was never a pre writer in like school when we had essays and whatever. Obviously, it's a very different structure from um, screenwriting. But because of that, I find outlining and pre writing like so tedious. I hate it, and I don't have the muscle memory of it. So for me, the outlining phase of like figuring out all the beats and figuring all that, which is so important, is like the most uh oh so i get stuck a lot on that process uh because structure too like although it's really story structure is very interesting because it's something i think we all inherently understand and we feel it when it's right and we feel it when it's wrong but being able to execute it in this in this in the very limited format of a screenplay is very challenging so uh it's not in my bones yet you know I'm, even still like a couple years into writing I, i'm not it's not effortless for me you know like with the acting like i've done it so long i put in my ten thousand hours like i have a routine that works for me a process that works for me i can do it in my sleep even if i have having an off day i can do it writing is still like an efforted thing for me it's mm. it's it's hard i will say like writing is the hardest thing i've ever done especially screenplay because it is such it is a a, a art form of scarcity you know every word matters you don't have the luxury of droning on and on like you do in like a novel or something. You can, you know, you have a, you have 90 pages to make it happen. And like mm -hmm. the white space is equally important. So because of that, you have to be ruthless with your cuts and you really have to know where you're going and know what you're doing. So I think that that focus is really important. So when I'm in the zone and I've done that work, I think like I can take the distractions, I can jump right back in. But in those early, in the earlier part of the process for me, it's, it's harder for me. It's easier for me to get distracted. It's easier for me to get bumped up, you know, and like, yeah. as soon as I got to take a walk, I'm like, I'll come back to it. That's something that I've 
figured out that I'm actually either getting worse at or never was good at in the first place. Now that I'm starting to pay attention, because whenever I get up to go do something, it it takes. A, I mean, I can come back and sit down and keep going, but it's not at the same velocity. It's not at the same. Uh, it doesn't have the same type of uh, uh, push or like feel flow like, to it. it flow to it. Exactly. Yes. Um, and I have to spend some time to get back there. Um, totally. Has the industry overcome the bias against like the typical dumb blonde character? No. no. And how do you no. navigate that? How do you, because obviously we've been, you know, talking for the past over half an hour, we've, we've gone over all your accolades and we can obviously see, I mean, even before we even talked about it, I knew who you were cause I know who you are, but um, how do you help rewrite that narrative? Exactly. And that what you said right now is a big reason why I started writing in the first place. I think in my bio, I say I got sick of playing hot blonde, dumb blonde and hot, dumb blonde. And I, I mean, we've seen it like, but in the last like five to 10 years, we've seen a huge influx of female created content and like messy, flawed female characters. But that was so groundbreaking even recently, you know, I mean, 10 years ago, we didn't have that. So I really wanted to play roles that were dynamic and interesting. You know, I'm doing reading pilot scripts all the time and I'm the character that's interesting is the guy and the woman just exists in his orbit floating around him, you know, ancillary to him with no goals of her own, with no path of her own. It's all about the dude. And it's like, I want to play that character. You know, that's way more interesting. So I really wanted to play characters that were dynamic and flawed and complicated and human in a way that I didn't see reflected in the scripts I was getting in the auditions I was having. So I was like, okay, well, if no one's going to give me these roles or write these roles, I'm going to write them myself. Right. So that's kind of why I got into writing, just to be able to take that power back and claim ownership and be able to do the roles I wanted to do and play the characters I wanted to play because I wasn't getting those opportunities in the other things. Right. And that's the that's the best way to get that power back is to just take the reins, take the pen, take the computer and have at it yourself. So that's something uh, we definitely applaud you for. Please keep up the good work for sure. Um, I wanted Thanks. to make sure we touched on definitely two Subjects. So I'm gonna let you tell me which one we go with first, because I definitely wanted to get into um, your love of dogs because yes. you have um, participated in a lot of organizations and you have obviously you and Tim rescue dogs, which I think is phenomenal. And I also wanted to make sure we touched on your current and future projects as well, too. So which one do you want to start yeah. with? Let's talk with let's talk about dogs. Let's Shit. talk about the dogs. You yeah. like dogs. You do like dogs. Yes, indeed. Where did this love come from? Did you have dogs growing up? Um, what 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 uh, yeah. facilitated? Yeah, I've been an animal lover like out of the womb, dude. I I loved animals from the beginning. Uh, there's like the, one of the oldest family videos I have of me is I think I was talking about I couldn't walk in London in the snow, so I'm like bundled up in this thing and I like fall flat on my face and then I stand up and my mom's like, look a dog. I'm like, yeah, and I run in. I'm like, totally fine. I I we grew up with dogs. We had a cat for a little bit. Um, I also grew up riding horses. We mm -hmm. started riding when I lived in the UK and I loved it. So literally since I could walk, I I was on a horse. So I love animals. I just do. I, I always have. I'm like a hippie at heart, you know, like I, I my growing up, I would never let my mom kill an, an insect that we found in the house. I'd be like, take it outside, take it outside. My sister's like terribly afraid of spiders. My sister's like, kill it, kill it, dad. I'm like, no, don't kill it, take it outside. I just have like, I think all things should be allowed to live. And I have a very, yeah, that's just always been my vibe. So I've always loved animals. So I started volunteering when I left my day job and I was acting and, and doing uh, the creative stuff full time. My schedule obviously looked a lot different, right? I had a lot more like gaps in it and free time available. So I started volunteering at the shelter. And while I grew up with dogs, I didn't really have any firsthand experience with pit bulls. I grew up with, I think mostly like, we, I don't know, we had a couple of mutts, we had like um, golden retrievers and we had all kinds of stuff growing up. But I, I, my first really like introduction to pit bulls was in the shelter system here in LA. And at that time, I mean, still today, unfortunately, there, you know, it's like 80% pit bulls for the large dog breeds. There's just so many of them in the shelter system. And I just fell in love with their personalities and their resilience. And it started to drive me crazy how if I would be out in the area by the shelter walking like a Rottweiler or a German Shepherd or another large breed, people would walk up right next to me. And if I had a pit bull, they'd be like, ooh, and they'd walk across the street and act like, you know, so dramatic, like yeah. the dog's going to eat them. Is that why just, most of them are in the shelters? Why is it mostly put pit bulls in there? I mean, it's a, it's a combination of factors. There's still a lot of housing discrim like discrimination where they won't allow certain breeds in certain um, apartments or certain homeowners insurance companies won't cover your house if you own pit bulls. So there is definitely like legislative uh, discrimination against the breed. Um, 
you know, and then for a minute, I feel like we've, if you look at the history of dogs, which is a very weird thing to say, but there's like a, a villain of the moment. Like at one point, German Shepherds were like the bad dog. At one point, Dobermans were like the bad dog. At one point, Rottweilers were the bad dog. So the pit bull has kind of been stuck as like the bad dog in our modern society for a minute now. So you're seeing that stigma and that stereotype slowly start to change. But that's a contributing factor as well. Um, and then they're just, they're also popular. Like, so it's like, because they're popular and then they have these restrictions and then people overbreed them. It's a whole, you know, plethora of things that, that contribute to that. But yeah, I think um, the fact that they still get a bad rap and that there's still a lot of discrimination, you know, legislative or otherwise against them contributes to the fact that they are a big, a big part of the the large dog breed in the, in the shelter system. So I just became like a crazy people lady. Cause I was like, these dogs are great. People are nuts. Um, and then, yeah, as soon as we got a house and we had a yard, I was like, we're adopting. And then we've, we've adopted ever since. And, and I've been volunteering in the shelter system since then. I've, I've, um, I've volunteered in the city shelters. I volunteered with best friends, animal society. They had a, a shelter in West LA and I used to do all their adoption videos for all their dogs that came in and probably did like, I don't know, man, 2000 adoption videos. People used to like recognize me in the street and at the grocery store from like their dog adoption videos. It was so funny. They'd be like, oh my God, do my dog's adoption video. Oh my God. And they'd be really excited. And then I would get these messages, people telling me like, you're the reason I adopted my dog. And it was amazing. I loved it. Um, and now I mostly work with a group called Angel City Pitbulls. We have a, a shelter facility. We actually took over the old South LA, which was vacant now. They moved um, They moved about 10 minutes away. So this facility was sitting empty for a couple of years. And then now a couple of groups moved in. So there's like a low cost vet clinic upstairs. There's a cat rescue and there's us. Uh, and we do a lot of community outreach, free trainings and stuff like that in the facility as well. It's kind of a nice hub. So I help uh, run that shelter facility. We're all volunteers. So we all do this in addition to like our normal day jobs. Um, I also run play groups. And one of my dogs is like the tester dog that we use. So when we get a new dog from the shelter, we want to assess a number of things to make sure we can find a good home for them. One of those is like, how are they with other dogs? What's their dog skill? What's their play style? All that kind of stuff. So my one dog donkey, she will meet every single dog that we pull. Um, she's like their first friend and she'll tell us, you know, and we'll figure out like what, what their vibe is. Do they like dogs? Are they not? Are they really playful? Are they chill? Whatever. Like, so we can help match them to the best home. So yeah, I do that usually with her like once or twice a week and she loves it. <laughs> awesome. Phenomenal. And you have how many dogs at your home now? Yeah. So we just, we lost our, our girl, um, Jojo uh, in the, when was it? early March. I'm so sorry. we have two right now. It's okay. Thank you. So we're, we've, we're fostering. So we're in between right? fosters right now. So we have two, um, mm -hmm. we will be looking for a third again very soon. So yeah, usually three, we had two dogs. Okay. So first we had one dog. We always knew we wanted two. We got adopted Riley when we bought our house in 2011 and then, um, got our second dog later that year. And then it took me five years of wearing Tim down to get a third. I was mm. like, I was relentless on my quest because he didn't want a third. He only wanted two. And I was like, babe, don't you want a third? Don't you want a third? Don't you want a third? Like every day for five years. And I finally wore him down. So then we ended up with three. <laughs> and that's well, the, where we're staying. The fruits People of your labor. <laughs> yeah. It might take 15, 20 years to get four, right? Exactly. Yeah. It's a process. Yeah. Well, Tim gave in. Well, good for you for sticking with the process. You have three three dogs and their names are Yeah, so so um so my first dog was Riley and he Riley. passed away in twenty I don't know, a couple years ago. And then Jojo just passed away recently, and then we have Donkey and Butters. Okay. So Donkey yes. and Butters. Rest in yes. peace, Riley and Jojo. That is for you're yes. doing a, a great thing. Um if you've never looked into um, I'm serving at a, at a shelter or adopting a dog, please do. Uh, Victoria is a great person to lead the way as, as she continues to shed the light here at the Parallax Effect with us. Um, so definitely uh, kudos to both you and Tim for taking that assignment on. That's very, very beautiful. Thank you. Um, yes, and I will plug real quick. I will say, like, whatever breed you're into, I know I'm into pit bulls, and that's fine. Some people don't, but like, even if you're into like a very specific breed, I guarantee you, if you Google whatever state you're in or city you're in, if you Google that breed, like Golden Retriever Rescue, Southern California, you will find a rescue group that is rescuing the dogs from that breed. So there's no need to go to a breeder. There really is no need. You can find what you want. It might take a little longer, you know, especially if you want a puppy or you have very specific requirements, but you can find an amazing dog in a rescue group or the shelter environment and you're really saving a life. And we, our shelters right now are inundated and healthy, adoptable, nice dogs get put to sleep for space daily. So like adopt, please. That's my plea. When, That's my in, <laughs> doubt, <laughs> when in doubt, Google it out, search it out. Um, mm -hmm. you are, you, you said angel city is the, is the, com is the organization, right? Are there any others yeah. in the LA area that people could yeah. know about? Oh, there's tons of great, there's so many great rescues in the LA area, but, um, best ones animal society is still a thing. They have, a, um, they've gotten rid of their main facility. 
uh, which was taken over by a group called Pause for Life, and they're fantastic. They actually they do free training, six week training programs, and they send the dogs to uh, some of the prisons. And the prisoners work with the dogs and build a relationship, so it's enrichment for the dogs, it's enrichment for the prisoners. A lot of the guys who get out end up working for the organization again. They have skill sets. It's great. So that's a fantastic program. They are in Mission Hills, their facility. They have so many amazing dogs. Um, they just do really really good work. So yeah, their best friends is their NKLA West LA place is still open again. Angel City Pit Bulls is great. Um, there's there's so many uh, a purposeful rescue um, blue man dog literally there's a gajillion so whatever you're into just google rescue in your area and you can find something to get involved in you can also volunteer at the city or county shelters they always desperately need volunteers and are very grateful for anyone who can help yeah and we'll leave some more information actually in the show description um, as well that you can search during before or after the show and leave a comment if you have any um, experience or if uh, you have any further questions about how to um, obtain such information. Yes, indeed. Um, Victoria Vertuga is here on the Parallax Effect, as we just mentioned for sure. Um, future projects, current projects, what we got going on? What are we looking forward to? Yeah. Yeah. So actually next um, Friday is the LA premiere of my latest feature film um, called Cold Was the Wind. So we premiered a couple months ago at a big film festival, horror film festival called Horror Hound. Now we're at another one called Days of the Dead. So that'll be awesome. It'll be the first time our cast and crew is able to come see it. So I'm really excited for everybody to see it. It should be very, very fun. And then that movie will do its little festival run for the next couple months or whatever. And then hopefully next time, next year sometime, that movie will be out and available. But in the meantime, um, my web series is called Disgraced. You can find that on Amazon, Tubi, all the AVOD services, it's out there. And then uh, same thing for my feature film, Lexi, which is like a, a thriller horror film. Uh, you can find that on same thing, Amazon Prime, Tubi, all the usual spots. Uh, Disgrace is like a dark comedy. It's, uh, it's, it's eight episodes. They're all under 10 minutes. I think total running time is like around an hour. And uh, Lexi is a feature film and it is uh, about 90 minutes. So yeah. Check them out. Hit it Into up. That. Amazon Prime. What other mediums did we say that we can look yeah. at them at? Tubi. Um, Tubi. Yeah, Plex. All the, yeah. If you go to, if you go to um, IMDB or if you go to justwatch.com, it'll give you a list of like all the platforms. Where and it's we will but leave it in the show it. description. That is your homework. As soon as you're done listening to this episode, <laughs> hit it all up. Watch. Enjoy. Um, this is why, you know, people like Victoria do this work for your enjoyment sit down with your family with your friends whomever and just have a good time right totally totally it's really fun to be able to like interact with people and get you know their responses and their reactions and whatever like as an artist it's it's just so satisfying whether they like it or they don't like it like it's just cool to see people talk about things and relate to it and see what resonates and what doesn't it's it's awesome so yeah, yeah. and Very you know i think i mean I, the, the the film industry obviously has always been huge but i think during the pandemic ever so much so right because that's what we were all doing pretty much was just finding more tv shows more movies and you know i sit down and watch most of my uh, shows and films with jasmine and she's always looking for characters that she can identify with or that really speak to her in a certain way um as well too so it's definitely a beautiful thing that creators like yourself are keeping people like me entertained um and fulfilled you know what i mean so that's always a great thing for sure for sure um we do a thing, I think I'm set on calling it light speed, kind of a play on the parallax effect. It's just like a whatever, rapid fire. Um, do you wish to participate? Okay, we have Victoria Vertuga in the virtual uh, online studio for the parallax effect, and she has agreed to partake in light speed. So here we go. Um, did you want to be a vet when you were growing up? Yes. Okay. And what happened? You, uh, um, I, okay. So lo a lot of things, uh, cause I love animals. Good question. So primarily I think, oh, being a vet is really tough. Suicide rates among vets are like insanely high. It is a very thankless job. When I, when I kind of realized that most dogs hate the vet, like most, and most pet animals that you're seeing are like very stressed out there. They're not enjoying it. it, it you're not getting to like, they're not like, yay, I'm going to the vet. So your experiences and your interactions with animals are very like stressful and, and not necessarily positive. So I did not really want to do that. So that's why I get my dog fixed, like volunteer 
volunteering and taking them out on walks and playing whatever and the things that are like fun and enjoyable i will say we have a vet that works with our organization as well as pause for life who does what they call like fear free vetting and so they make it like as much of a positive experience for the dogs as and it's dogs that's what we see but as possible and like she's so amazing and every all of our animals absolutely adore her so it's really cool to see people doing stuff in that space but like that is a very difficult challenging do- uh, job so yeah very stressful i think uh, sometimes unrewarding job yes, so that is it why is, I, it is definitely, I think it is on the list of one of the most stressful jobs but i haven't looked at that list in a while so i may have to pull it back up again yes. but that does sound familiar um do yep. you play an instrument yes piano piano yeah, I, I write I started playing at a very young age. I used to do recitals and all that kind of stuff. And then um, when I write songs, I w- would write on piano. I so, used yeah. to play at recitals too. Wow, I didn't know we had that in common. That's pretty good. I used to walk oh, up there in my little tails and flap them out yes. and go sit on the. T- yeah, it God, was. Why do we have to dress so formally? So funny. I know. It is. It was, it was a memory for sure. Um, how many songs have you written? Oh my God. So many songs. I have like binders of oodles and oodles of songs. And then for a while, uh, during end of college and while I was uh, working in the music industry I was working with a couple like groups and stuff doing a lot of like R&B pop stuff for them nothing really ever hit but it's still fun to do like a lot of demos and whatever so I don't even know man hundreds hundreds and hundreds of songs hundreds and yeah. hundreds and hundreds and here's my USC quarterback question Carson Palmer yeah. or Matt Liner or other I mean okay so I got only the tail end of Carson's career obviously he had a very storied career and a much better NFL career but I gotta go Liner because that just feels more like like home and college for me so I gotta I gotta give it to Liner yeah just, Liner yeah. was the man I, I mean it was wow. so oh, it was so good yeah like I, those, those just passes we'd score in like you know down the whole field in eight seconds like just the the yeah we were like it was just crazy how quick we could score and how like uh what's one of the more explosive everything was on the offense it was just unbelievable so yeah, yeah. it was a great time it was a great time for awesome. USC that's for sure um yes. when you write are you writing with a pen or are you using your computer okay so songwriting i will always write with a paper and pen okay. uh if i'm doing a song screenplay i will write in general on my computer um if i'm somewhere else i'll still write so i'll write with a notepad i bring a notebook with me like when i travel on planes and when i do stuff like that and a lot of times i'll do my outline on the notebook but then when i time you know when it comes time to actually write it because i have to do it in like final draft and it's a whole thing and format and whatever I'll do with my computer. But if I like, if you're asking me what I prefer, I do prefer a pen and pad. Ballpoint like, pen or gel your... pen? Um, gel. Okay. Yes. I'm a ballpoint. Ballpoint's point. the inkier one, right? Is the is no the, the gel like the is inkier? the inkier one. The 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 ballpoint for me at least the ballpoint leaks okay. less for me. Okay. So I use I don't know what it is. Uh, like literally a big click stick is my favorite writing implement. I just there like it. Go. It's like a nice smooth flow. It, like I don't have to worry about a lid because I will forever lose lids. I lose my whole. I lose, my mom used to say growing up, you lose your head if it wasn't screwed on. I would lose my head if it wasn't screwed on. Right. So yeah, no lids. I lids. prefer the no lids too, and I go with the ballpoint pens. When I'm a pen, I'm just a pen nerd. Um, so there's yeah. always going to be some. Kind Are you into of, like fancy pens? I am. Are you into like nice? Oh, I am. Yes, yeah. yes indeed. Uh, so that that's one that Jasmine actually just got me for my birthday. So I'm just really having nice. a good time writing. That's stuff. great. That's a I great. I write for no reason now. Let me just write something down. Because uh, it's pretty. My mom yeah. has this crazy thing. It's like um, it's made out of like I don't know, just like lead, but it's it's beautiful. It's like an artwork. It's like a it's like a rose carved into this thing, but you can write on it. And it's like it's that that every time I go home and I'm at her house, I'm like, Ooh, just like yeah. some things you just want to write with, right? Like they make you want to pick it up and write. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So that that is where <laughs> that question came from. So that question might have been a little selfish on my end, but hey, that's okay. I like it. Um, that's okay. And, and it's your, your show. Do what you want. Hey, we're making it happen here on the Parallax Effect podcast. What can I say? It's all about perspective. Um, in your opinion, best written TV show and or movie that comes to the top of your uh, Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad, Bra- hands down. Breaking Bad. Yeah, such a classic Bad. show. Definitely uh, still I, in my I, top five. I rewatched it. Yes, I rewatched it probably more than any other show. And what I find so amazing about it, besides just everything is fucking perfect, is like my experience, every watch is different. Like my mm. opinions on the people, the characters are different and their actions are different. Like my my experience of it is so different depending on my mindset or like whatever's going on. Or, I don't know. It's just, it's so, it's so cool. Plus the more I watch it, the more I notice like all the areas of brilliance, just like everything they did so beautifully, you know, it reveals itself to you upon further watches. And I just think that is such a, a show, like and when you make something really good, it, it it's a little bit of magic, do you know what I mean? And mm. that show, just like everything aligned, everyone at the top of their craft, just like doing their thing in such a beautiful way. It's just like such a, 
a magical thing to exist. So love that show. In the heyday of that show, that was also when kind of the 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 the, the scales were tipping back and forth with Breaking Bad and Mad Men. And I yep. really enjoyed both those shows. I think they both ser- served obviously a different purpose. I think uh, totally. Break- Breaking Bad, like you said, had just, they both had great staff on the entire show, but Mad Men left you with a little bit more to the imagination, I thought, because you had to kind of interpret yes. people's mannerisms and how they looked at each other. Um, and it was obviously a little bit of a slower show, but I can definitely appreciate the greatness. Yes of both shows at the time really good time totally. and tv my my favorite writing teacher actually was um a series regular on mad men and then went on to write afterwards because she was lucky enough to you know obviously be acting on that show and the writing was so excellent when she came off of it and was auditioning for other things she's like oh my god everything else sucks and it's like, yeah girl everything else sucks so she became a writer and she's probably one of the smartest who i've ever met and anyway yeah that's my random plug to that she's a fantastic her name's alexa alamani if anyone wants to write with her shout, study out, with her. It's bad shout out to yeah. alexa what you say alexa Alamani. Alamani. Bad pitch writer's class is her, is her class. And she's dope. And she was on that. Good times. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Good to have connections like that at USC. Um, mm-hmm. if, if that's how you connected with her, I'm not sure. But um, either way, good way. Good Actually, to have she connections. Teaches, she teaches at USC now. So well, there yeah. you go. There you go. I was not that far off. Um, some of the more. Uh, oh, before we even get there. Hold on. Let me go down my list. Um, favorite musician. Uh, Tupac. Tupac, indeed. That's why we're super tight. I knew there was more reasons. Um, what is probably okay? If you had your pick, okay, and I'm now I'm talking mm-hmm. like theater, like Pantages or whatever there is. What theater would you like to perform at? Ooh, oh my god, there's so many beautiful theaters. Pantages is is so stunning. Um. Oh, I don't know. That's hard. I, I have to look at that. Like one of my favorite things to do when I travel is go to like the music halls and the theaters. Cause I love that architecture. Mm-hmm. So I think that Pantages is, I, and I don't know the names of some, so many of them, but like there's been so many beautiful ones, but in LA Pantages is dope. I also love the old ones in the Bro- old Broadway district. Like there's a theater at the Ace Hotel. There's the Orpheum and there's one other one over there that I can't think of. That's really cool with that old, like gothic architecture. That's my jam. So yeah, anywhere like that. Are you kidding? That's like amazing when it's beautiful and like, it's, it's like a Somebody actually put care into the making of it. There's like details and whatever. I love it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the architecture too. I've only been to the Pantages yes. once when we saw Hamilton. Um, yes. And it just so- took it took me a while to even kind of just focus in on the stage. Luckily, we got there a little bit early so I can get all that out the way. But I was just looking around at all the different features of the theater. I was just I was amazed. Yes, it is. It's so beautiful. Yeah, it's, it's it is. Every time I walk in there, I'm like, oh, it's just it's stunning. It's such a stunning theater. Some of the nicest actors or actresses that you have met during your journey. Yes. Oh my God. Okay. So uh, Mark Harmon on NCIS is like so, 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 so nice. Um, Dexter was really nice. Um, Michael C. Hall, that is. Uh, that was like the first time I booked a job where it was a show that I watched and I was like, oh, and all my scenes were with him and it was like very nerdy and cool. I'm like, I'm trying not to act like a fan, you know, whatever. Um, uh, there's been so many. Why can't I think of nice people? Um, Da, 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 da. and Keith Gordon the director on Dexter was so nice he like went and sat and had lunch with me um during one of our days of filming and he was like so so kind um why am I only thinking isn't it funny you ask me like nice people and all my, my, my mind instantly goes to the bad experiences and then you ask when people ask me the bad experiences my mind goes the other way but yeah um uh, I didn't Flip get to work on, on the show but but the cast of Community which is like um uh, Joel McHale Allison Brie uh Gillian Anderson, um, everybody but Chevy Chase. People, I have a bunch of classmates and friends who have been on that show, and they said that that was one of the nicest sets they've been on too, with the exception of Chevy Chase. Um, the people were just super, super nice. But yeah, I'm blanking on the. Re- there's like, there's other nice people, but yeah. those are my, those are my nice. Allison <laughs> Bree, one of our Mad Men uh, um, alum, yes. right? Yeah, so I follow yes. her her career. Yeah, she's yeah. she's oh, really she's good. So I yeah. ran her on the picket lines too. Um, you know, while we're striking, uh, and she's like just so cool. She's so nice. Yes, so, yeah. and and actually we should pivot there. But well, yeah. let me get let me get one more of these out. We should pivot to the strike because that's a, that's yeah. really important. I'm glad you brought that up, and I'm sorry I didn't think of that before we started talking. Um, oh, yeah, no worries. But would you rather be known for uh, a huge blockbuster film, could be a sequel, whatever, or a hu- one huge television series? Series. I'm a series, series. girl. Okay. Even though I, I make 
movies now, especially, it's funny, I, TV is my preferred art, art form. I like to spend more time in the world with the characters. And so I just feel like a feature is so short, you don't get to do as much. Like you really get to go there and take risks and do a lot with the storytelling in a series. So like my ultimate dream is to be like a Phoebe Waller-Bridge, an Issa Rae, a Mindy Kaling, whatever, to be the, like the writer creator star of a series. That would be my ultimate, oh my God, this is amazing. This is my dream. That would be dope and, it, and it's yeah. coming. We are putting the energy out there for you, Victoria Vertuga, for sure. My air conditioner just went off and it is heating up in here. So mm -hmm. turn it back on. So sorry about that, everybody. But we need to make sure we don't overheat in here um, as well. And who is the one actor? I mean, I'm sorry. Who is the one director, producer, or producer uh, you would pick up the phone for no matter what? Oh, there's so many. Can I give you a list? Okay, so obviously Vince Gilligan because at Breaking Bad, like if I... Yes, please, Stephen Skilligan. I'm obsessed with Taika Waititi. I'm obsessed with Edgar Wright, um, Sam Esmail. Um, there's so many. So I actually also keep, because I'm a freak, I keep a list, like when I'm watching TV and I love an episode of something, I keep a list of the, I go and I find out who directed that episode. And every single person on my list in the past five years has gone on to do like ridiculously huge, amazing things. Um, so I'm always just like, keeping my eye out for dope cinematographers dope directors whose work i like but yeah uh, i think my top would be yeah like vince gilligan edgar wright taika waititi i would lose my mind and be really excited also ron howard oh my god there's there's so many but yeah excellent excellent yes there are indeed um i got that question because i think it was who was it matt damon who said yeah if christopher nolan called nolan and calls. doesn't matter what i was doing i'm picking up and he did. um and he did he's like, i'm not acting anymore and then he's like uh you want to be an oppenheimer and matt damon's like i'm gonna be an oppenheimer <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. yeah i guess i'm back now yeah exactly. but very important that you brought up the writer strike thank you so much um i don't know how much everybody kind of knows about i mean because this happens you know every once or so often but um what what have you what coming from somebody who has some inside information where are we at here um and are we going to reach any type of agreement anytime soon yeah, so the good news is uh, that um, AMPTP, the organization that represents the studios, um, and the WGA went back to talks. They went back to start talking um, starting last Friday. So they are talking again. So what happened was, what happens is there's the, the, the basic theatrical agreement is up every three years for mm. all of the major guilds, which is basically SAG for the actors, the DGA, which represents the directors, and the WGA, which represents the writers. And they all kind of um, expire, if you will, around the same time. And so the this organization bargains with all of those unions. And so each union will get a chance, like an order and a, a amount of time to bargain with that group and reach an agreement. And then if no agreement is reached, then then we go on strike. Um, so the negotiations and the bargaining and the stuff happens every three years as the contract is renewed. Um, historically, the DGA goes first and then the WGA and then SAG. Uh, pretty much every time that we've ever had a strike, the DGA is like, nah, WGA, you go first. And that usually is an indication uh, that we're going to have a strike. So that's the case. Uh, that was the case in 2007, 2008. And that's the case this time where the DGA deferred to the WGA and said, you guys go first. Um, so as you know, WGA wasn't, a, wasn't able to reach an agreement and they've been on strike since what, May 2nd or sometime in May. And then um, they... Then the DGA was up next and they were able to reach an agreement. And then SAG was up next and SAG was not able to reach an agreement. So SAG is also on strike as of July. So what that means is like for those months in between, since SAG has been, or sorry, since the WJ was on strike, uh, they weren't talking to each other. There's no communications. The WJ was like, hey, you guys want to come back to the table and like keep this moving? We're, we're here anytime. But they were so far apart on issues that, you know, that they, they couldn't work it out. So uh, the... AMPTP was not even interested in going back to the table and having more discussions uh, until this last week. They had like a pre-meeting, like to see if they'd be open and whatever. It didn't go super well, but obviously they worked it out again after that. And now they've actually officially gone back to start negotiating as of Friday. So that's hopeful because at least they're talking, right? You're not going to get anywhere if you're not talking. Um, however, they are still, there are a, a lot of issues. This is a very crazy time. We've seen tremendous changes to our industry in the past decade, I mean, tremendous changes that haven't really been addressed and have kind of been snowballing into this, this situation where we have now where it's like not tenable for anybody to make a living and, and the, the, the money that people have earned historically and whatever is being ripped off from under them. And it's just basically like created a whole slew of stuff. Plus we have AI, we have a lot of factors going on. So there are a lot of issues and they are so, you know, decently apart on some of these issues. So I don't think it will necessarily be a super quick thing. 
but at least they're talking. So as long as the talks continue, that's that's promising. But so basically, the WGA needs to reach an agreement. And then after that, SAG still needs to come back to the table with them and reach an agreement as well. So we still have to get through it with two organizations that have, you know, a lot of things on this agreement, a lot of different items on the agenda. So it's going to be a minute, I think. Um, mm. Super optimistically, I mean, again, this is my opinion and no one knows, we're all just speculating, right? But super optimistically, I would say the end of September would be the quickest. I would think that they could realistically get through both unions and get get a deal struck, um, which would be amazing that, you know, if that's the case. So that would be, that really only gives us like six weeks from now, right? We're in the middle of August. Yeah. So I think that that's the fastest it would happen. Um, it did, you know, there's people who are like, oh, it's going to go well into next year. I hope that's not the case. I think, I think... I don't think that it will go that long. I hope not. Um, I also think that, you know, a lot has changed since the last strike in 2007, 2008 in terms of um, our, the climate in this country regarding labor. Uh, we've, we've had more labor disputes in the past three years than we've had since the 1940s. Um, they're, literally, it's called hot labor summer, right? The hot strike summer is what we're calling it because like mm -hmm. you know, UPS almost went on strike. The teachers have been on strike. The um, hotel workers are on strike. The... Uh, whatever there's been a gajillion labor movements and strikes and organizations or almost strikes and all that kind of stuff so you're seeing it affect every industry and in every sphere as the wealth gap is widening and people can't make a living wage and the rich are getting richer especially ceos of these companies because publicly traded companies so it's really created a climate of solidarity among workers of all industries and i think that the fact that you know wga and sag are striking has allowed a lot of other people to shine some light onto their struggles in other industries. So when you're out on the picket lines, like every single day, there is another union there. You know, there's a teachers union, there's whatever. There's a million other unions coming and showing solidarity and support. So I'm not sure that they were really expecting that climate, um, them being the AMPTP. And also we have social media now. So like a lot of the shady kind of tricks and, and things that that organization would do. Oh, my light just died. Sorry, now I'm in the dark. That's Hold okay. on. We're just gonna talk. Wait, just two seconds. We'll have shitty lighting now, but we'll have lighting. Um, so I think that that uh, social media has allowed the guilds to shine a light on these like shady things that are happening, and get the public on their side and draw attention to the stuff that kind of went under the radar before social media was such a thing in, in the era of the last strike. So, right. for example, I don't know if you heard about TreeGate. It's like stupid it's things as, as petty as the they cut all the trees on the main um, block at Universal where we pick it. So that they wouldn't be in shade, so that picketers would have to be in the heat. Wow! Like, no, I, I was you know, not that, aware of that. Okay. Wow! Yeah, so they called it Tree Gate, and actually got like a bunch of national press and the Washington Post and other outlets and whatever because it's just like the degree of pettiness is ridiculous. So they actually, our city controller, like Keith Mejia or Kenneth Mejia, he uh, like they didn't file a permit. They weren't allowed to cut them. They're gonna get fined. It's like a stupid minimal fine of two hundred fifty dollars. But just the fact that they would be willing to do this just to throw shade, like just to be that janky. Uh, they can't get away with that now. Like that became a whole media sensation, a national story. So I think the fact that there is social media allows people to shine a light on that kind of stuff and cast them in a very negative light. And the things that they've said, you know, we want writers to go homeless and lose their homes and we want to bury them. And just like a lot of the rhetoric that's come out, I, I don't think that they were quite prepared for how they would be cast in the media and the kind of public sentiment around it. So um, I also don't think that they expected SAG to go on, on strike. I think they were always expecting the writers to strike. I don't think they were expecting SAG to strike. So we haven't had a double strike since 1960. Um, the last time that we did, that's how we got pension. That's how we got residuals. So, and that's how we got healthcare. So uh, if you look at the history of unions, at least our unions in entertainment, I'm sure it's a, a very similar story in other unions. Every major thing we have, every good big thing we have, we got as the result of a strike. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's a kind of a sad testament. Like there's a there's some politician way back in the day who said, a just people don't need to be governed. I feel like it's the same thing with a business. Like if you're if you're treating people in your business well, you don't need to worry about labor disputes, right? You don't like if if everyone is is treated with respect and being paid a living wage and like feeling valued. You don't need to worry about this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But when you're not treating people with respect and you're not paying them what they're worth, then you do have to worry about this. So um, it's just an interesting historical perspective that like every single thing we have, we had to get through the result of like fighting for it, you know, right. um, and withdrawing our labor. So, yeah, so it's, it's a crazy time. I, I don't have an answer. Nobody has an answer, but I at least they're back to talking. So that's good news. Um, yeah, we'll see what happens. It's a crazy well, time. Well, for thank sure. you for explaining to us that don't really have uh, the information, you know, we talked about getting the information before we were talking about, you know, Tim and, and our conversations. Thank you for giving us that information. And, you know, 
here at the Parallax Effect Podcast. We obviously support uh, you. We support the uh, WGA um, and SAG as well. We support both of you, uh, both groups, um, and to get a deal done, uh, a just deal, right, that is allowing people to live um, and participate, you know, in the way that they know how and the way that they love into society. So I appreciate uh, appreciate you for giving us that, that for sure, that knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. And keep, keep fighting yeah. with them. Get out there with yeah. those no trees. Um, hopefully you guys are bringing some tents or something because uh, that is, right? yeah, that, that is very petty. I can't, I can't believe that, that they would do something like that. But what yep. do I know? But what did we learn on this episode today is a better question because I definitely learned a lot. I learned about more about the strike. Um, I learned about the groups involved. Um, I learned you know, a little bit about more of the history of the, of the previous strikes in the past and what has been necessary to get a justifiable solution, right? Um, but what, what did we learn on today's show, Victoria? Oh my God. I don't know. Hopefully we learned, hopefully we learned a lot of things. I learned that you like ballpoint pens. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Um, ballpoint pens. We both played the piano. Yep. Uh, yes. So a lot of a lot of similarities yeah. happen in there. That's that's a good thing. That's a good thing for sure. Um, before we wrap up, just want to remind everyone on Instagram, you can find us Parallax Effect Media. Once again, that is Parallax Effect Media on Facebook, the Parallax Effect Podcast. Look us up on Twitter. That is Parallax Effects with an S. Once again, that is Parallax Effect with an S. And please subscribe our, to our YouTube channel. The link is right in the bottom, I think, right-hand corner. I'm pretty sure that's where it is. Um, leave us a rating. We are looking for five stars, but we are also looking to see how we can do better here at the Parallax Effect Podcast as well. Uh, Victoria Vertuga, where can the people find you if they need to follow up with you? Yes, so you can follow me on all the socials at my name, which is just at Victoria Vertuga. So Victoria and then V-E-R-T-U-G-A, at Victoria Vertuga on all the places. Um, yeah, you can watch, like I said, watch Lexi and Disgraced on Amazon, on Tubi, on all the spots. And yeah, thank you so much for having me. So fun. Oh, man, this has been a great time. I appreciate you uh, coming in and, and uh, giving us uh, the update on all things Victoria Vertuga. It's been great um, being associated with you and Tim for however many years we've been associated with each other. I've all been laughs. Um, all been positive experiences, um, especially, you know, for me, for people like Ryan Boykin as well, too. So shout out to him. Shout out to my best friend, Ryan. I know I got to mention him. So hopefully he gets to the end of the episode so he can hear his shout out. Um, but yes, we did it again at the Parallax Effect. Thank you so much again, Victoria, for joining us. Thank you for all of our listeners um, who continue to 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 listen, to watch, to give feedback. This has been an excellent experience for me. Um, hopefully it was a good experience for you as well, Victoria. So much fun. Are you kidding? It's amazing. It's awesome. It's been it. awesome. So thank you again for joining the Parallax Effect, where every angle reveals a new depth of understanding. For Victoria Vertuga, my name is Ryan Lavelle. We are signing off. See y'all on Amazon Prime. Load up that Lexi. Load up that Disgrace. And let's get it going. Mm-hmm. You've been watching the Parallax Effect podcast, where every angle reveals a new depth of understanding.